Hello, everyone. Welcome to our panel, Building Diverse DevOps Teams. My name is Ajuna Kiaruzi, and I'll be moderating this panel. I'm a technical evangelist at Datadog and have a background in SRE. Um, we have a lovely panelist here for you. I'm going to have them introduce themselves. Um, Caitlin, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, hi, my name is Caitlin Elfring. I'm a team lead in engineering at Datadog. I've been here for about four months now. Um, throughout my 10-ish year career, I've worked in a variety of different technology roles, uh, SRE, IT, software, systems engineering, um, and really excited to be here. Lisa? Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Lisa Davis. I'm from Mercedes-Benz Research and Development here in Seattle. That's just a fancy way of saying we're the part of the company that builds all the software that make our global fleet of vehicles work. I've been in the industry now for probably 20 years uh, in various individual contributor roles, and now I manage teams here at Mercedes-Benz that focus on uh, uh, the Kubernetes ecosystem and big data. Finally, Alex. Hi, I am Alex Flynn. I'm a senior IT manager at SAS Institute in Cary, North Carolina. I have been in this industry for over 30 years, and I started in a technical background as a Unix sysadmin and have grown throughout my career and now managing DevOps teams that include monitoring and observability as well as identity access management. I'm happy to be here today. Awesome. So I'll just give a quick um, overview for everyone. We're going to have a few questions. If anyone has questions or wants to post anything in the chat, please do. Um, I'll incorporate your questions if they're applicable during, but mostly I'll have kind of a good 20 minutes at the end that I will go through each of the questions. But to start us off, I wanted to kind of post to everyone, have you ever been on a diverse DevOps team and what does diversity sort of mean to you? Um, to spice things up, I'll, I'll move it around and maybe we can start with Lisa. Um, I think diversity means different things to different people. Um, I would say that teams I've been on in the last five years have definitely been more diverse than teams prior to that. Um, but I, I still think there's room for improvement. And when I say diversity, I mean, you know, uh, every kind of underrepresented group. Um, and specifically, I'm, I'm hoping to see more women. Um, that hasn't really kind of panned out uh, even now this long in the industry. So um, for me that, you know, I think it depends on what your definition of diversity is, but I would still like to see more diversity. What about you, Alex? So uh, specifically in DevOps, the teams that I work with, we've gone out of our way to try to make them more diverse teams. We do things like university recruiting. We go out and post jobs in areas where we think we can get a very diverse background, both um, uh, with gender diversity um, as well as racial diversity. There are so many categories of areas we, we try to check when we're looking for new candidates. But we have found, especially as we recently have been working very remotely, that we're also working with diverse teams on a global scale. So. And um, Caitlin? Yeah, I guess to kind of go off of global scale, um, I think at least recently working at Datadog, um, I've been working with more remote people and getting the chance to work with different people from different countries and different states um, has uh, really been really exciting for me. Um, and seeing that kind of diversity uh, on top of like uh, gender diversity, uh, racial diversity um, has been exciting. Um, but I do agree, like I think that there's still a lot of work to do throughout my career. I still have um, very rarely worked with anybody, any women who are more senior than me in an like an uh, IC perspective. Um, and I would love to see more of that too. Yeah, I know that all of us would definitely count as folks who are diverse in DevOps. What do you think are things in our history that have sort of 
helped keep you in these teams? Um, I know that you mentioned having leadership that looks like you would have been helpful for you, Caitlin. Have you had opportunities for that to have happened? Or are there things that have happened instead of that that you think have been helpful to sort of bridge a little bit of that gap? Um, I have seen uh, women who are more senior than me um, in management. Uh, there are still very few. And it is uh, encouraging for me and it kind of pushes me knowing that like, all right, they've paved the way for me, the women on this panel, uh, as an example, um, that I can kind of like, uh, I know that there's a future for me um, and there's more for me to do. And then also like giving back, um, mentoring more junior people than me and trying to help them steer their career in certain directions. Yeah, I think yesterday when we um, we chatted about this, mentoring and sponsoring was something that came up a lot, especially with you, Alex. Is there anything you want to add there? So in, in my experience, and like I said, I, I for this panel, I think I've been doing this the, the longest time. And when I started, there, there were no women senior managers in IT. And diversity was very... Um, lacking, shall we say. And I mentioned also in the past that I, I do go by a gender neutral name on purpose because I've been doing this for so long. And I didn't want people to have expectations when they heard my name and, and what I was doing. Um, but one of the things that's very important and we should all take forward, if you are a person that is in a diverse group, if, if you check one of those boxes, then you should think about sponsoring or mentoring either a peer, someone who is on another team, someone you can identify that could grow into this type of position. You know, a lot of what we do in technology is all about the network that we build for ourselves and reaching out and sponsoring other people, encouraging them to look at different positions, thinking about things outside of what they're doing today is so important. Yeah, for you, Lisa, how, what has helped you? Have you had a chance to get mentor that's been helpful or what has kept you going in DevOps all this time? Hmm. <clears throat> so for me, um, I got my start in uh, QA of, of all things and uh, spent several years there. And it became clear to me that, you know, that there's a concept um, called shifting left, right? Where you essentially shift the QA element left to, to kind of get ahead of preventable issues. Um, and and in, in a lot of the organizations I was in, it, it didn't really work out that way. And so I migrated towards DevOps because I saw what they were doing there. And it just turns out that for me, it was more fun. So that's kind of where I've been for probably the last decade. Uh, and even now, I find it more fun to kind of work on that kind of stuff. There hasn't really been um, uh, mentorship, I, I would say, um, but thankfully I, I tend to be a fairly tenacious person. So if there's something that I see that I want, I go after it. Um, I wish that I had the benefit of, of mentorship uh, in hindsight. There are probably some, some decisions that I could have made that might've been better for my career, but now I see it as an opportunity to kind of help mentor other women that I see coming through the same pipeline. Got it carry it forward. I know yesterday you also talked about trying to make sure to how to keep space for yourself. And is the tenacity you talked right. about what helps you with that? Yeah. And you know, what, what I mentioned was that if, if there's no seat, if, if there's no seat for you at the table to kind of bring your own chair. Um, and certainly I've done that in, in probably uh, every organization I've been in throughout the years. And you know, in some it was better received than in others, but you know, that tenacity is kind of what's helped me get to at least where I am for now. Absolutely. Um, so I wanted to jump to Alex real quick. I wanted to ask, what are the things that through your time working in IT and tech, what are the things that organizations have done to keep attracting you as, a, as someone in the field, but also what are the things you think organizations can do to attract more diverse candidates? So one of the reasons why I have been at, at, the, at SAS for such a long time is from the beginning and the early part of my career with them, they have very much embraced having uh, women and people of diversity um, working together. For example, they implemented things like for working mothers and on-site daycare. Um, 
they have encouraged us to go out and do university recruiting. So we all work for tech companies. We all know how hard it is to recruit. We all compete for the same resources and the same hiring. So we need to be really creative in how we get out there and get our names out there and get our companies out there and say, come join us. And in that case, we're able to go out and do, for example, university hackathons and meet some of these young people who haven't graduated yet and show them what the potential is for their careers. And by embracing them and, and showing them where they can be in a few years, you know, if, if your company won't do this, volunteer and do it yourself, you know? And, and by the way, go talk to your HR people about why you can't do it. I think that's a great opportunity to get to know the, the potential and up and coming uh, resources. What about you, Caitlin? Um, let's see. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. Do you mind coming back? Oh yeah, no problem. What about, uh, sure. let's jump to Lisa and then we'll see if you can think of something as well. Yeah. So I, th I think from my perspective, we have to talk about the elephant in the room, which is the pipeline problem. Um, <clears throat> I think it's one thing to say as an organization that you value diverse candidates and kind of, you know, seeking those candidates out. I think it's another thing entirely when you get looking and find that there really isn't a diverse pipeline in the first place. So, you know, I like the approach that Alex mentions about, you know, going to college campuses and kind of starting your recruiting from there before people really have a chance to kind of decide what they what they want to do with their careers to kind of, you know, explain to them why they should want to do DevOps or, or something similar. But you know, I, I think from, from my perspective anyway, there's a lot of room for improvement in terms of pipeline development generally in the industry. That's one of the things that I think I've been most challenged with is that, you know, as Alex mentioned, we're all competing for the very same talent. And it turns out it's not even just here in North America, it's happening in Europe, it's happening in, in Asia. Um, and, and so, you know, we're all trying to find the same diverse candidates because DEI is something that's on everybody's, you know, uh, radar right now. And uh, I, I don't, I don't know, I don't know that I have all the answers at this point, but I'm certainly open to trying new things to try to figure out how we build that pipeline in the first place. Yeah, I definitely think that the fields that are related to DevOps, like sysadmin, systems engineering, also ha struggle with the same issues of having diverse candidates. I know the way that I got into DevOps or SRE was through software engineering which and computer science, which does a little bit better of a job. Um, but whichever ways we can get the message out there that DevOps is an exciting field and there's a lot of fun problems to solve and try different things. I think that it'll really help diverse candidates kind of see themselves. Like you said, QA is also a great path. Um, kind of going on a sl slight anecdote, I know that my, one of my old managers was able to create internal transfers, a path from one of our kind of interning IT path into DevOps because obviously knowing computers well and systems well is very helpful for DevOps for folks who didn't have a strong of a coding background. So whatever initiatives your company can do to get even internal transfers as well as another opportunity there, especially if maybe they have a better chance of showing off or, or showing diverse candidates a path into maybe IT and then showing from IT into SRE or DevOps. Um, Caitlin, you did you transfer from SRE to SWE or am I remembering it the wrong way? So I actually started my career in um, IT on a help desk, answering okay. help desk questions like my email is not working. Um, and then I moved into systems engineering, managing data centers. Um, then I took a shift over to software engineering because I saw that as more um, attractable, and more like future proof. Um, and I think like the combo of understanding systems and understanding software took me onto the DevOps and SRE route. Um, and I really like having that like balance because um, I think that you get to solve problems, but you also understand the software side of things. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the challenges too is um, they don't, they, you usually go to college and you have software engineering or computer science where they teach you how to write code. 
Um, but DevOps is another side of things uh, that like, I don't know if they have college courses on that. Um, so like Alex and Lisa were saying, like going to college campuses and showing like, yes, you can go and write like application code, but there's also these really interesting problems that you can solve on the DevOps side of things um, is a great way to introduce people to it because otherwise like they might not really know. Well, and to be clear, my DevOps teams write a boat ton of code. So it's not like they're not going to get to write code during this anyway. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Most SREs and DevOps end up writing a lot of code too. Um, so that's why they don't know. They might not, college kids might not know that like they might have the idea that DevOps is just like, oh, I'm not going to write any code, but that's not at all true. <laughs> Definitely not. At the very least, that's you're going to do a that's lot of scripting. Yeah, that's the beauty of the hackathons is you get to go one on one with some of these folks and show them how you can solve problems. And it is so exciting to watch college students work on an issue and start to realize, oh, I'm not going to be sitting in a room or in a cube writing code all my life. There's so much potential out there for where, where we can go. And if you think about it, all of us in our career, no matter where you are, Every three or four years, the whole landscape changes. You know, were we talking about containers five years ago? No, we weren't. There is always something new to learn. And we have to embrace that. What, one thing you were asking me, as you know, um, about our companies and what we do. One thing we, we do at SAS is we allow people to do a tour of duty, which gets to what Lisa was saying about sharing um, roles and recruiting from different areas. So if you want to go try something in a different area, you're welcome to go do that for six months. If it doesn't work out, that's fine. You can go back to doing what you were doing before. If you love it, you can stay. Oh, that sounds great. I think it will give a lot of people an opportunity to just try out um, SRE or DevOps for a little while. We definitely had a, at my old company, we had a program like that as well. And that's how we got some of our diverse candidates who hadn't thought of themselves in the field until they tried it out. And as managers, you know, we'll do anything to keep our resources, even if it's moving them somewhere else in the company, just please don't leave. You know, it's, that's been a real issue yeah. the last few months. So. Yeah, that kind of can lead us to the question of like retention, right? Um, an another part of di uh, diversity and inclusion is also keeping the folks who you mm -hmm. have already attracted to be interested. Um, what are the different pivots that maybe you've been able to make during your career? I'll start with you, Alex, or just the different things that you think have been able to help you be retained as well. So again, a lot comes down to company benefits. And I'm really happy that so many tech companies have gotten on board with this like over the last 10 years. But a big part of it is work-life balance. So as a working mother, female, I had to think about my home life and how could I balance that and work? Was I going to leave? Was I going to take a different job? There's a lot of stress that comes with dealing with things at home as well as um, on the job. So anything a company can do to make work-life balance easier on an employee, no matter if, if you're a working mom, you're a working dad, um, I think that helps a lot. Uh, the, the other thing is, um, pay people fairly, pay people equally. That that helps a lot with retention. Yeah, we talked about compensation when we were discussing some of the topics of um, this panel. And I know that the, the um, what's it called? The Latina equal, equal Pay Day just actually passed the other day. Was that, that was last, last week? week? Yeah. yeah, October 21st. Mm -hmm. um, I know that with Lisa, you said that you recently have been able to get more equality in your pay. Can you chat with us a little bit about that, how you found out and some of the things that you were able to do? So in a, in a previous discussion with this group, we talked about, you know, the concept of, of pay equality. And, you know, what I mentioned was that it's only been in the last five years of my career that I think I've seen parity with my male counterparts. To be clear though, what I didn't say was that the only reason that happened was because of another woman. She was the EVP at a startup that hired me to basically do the, the same thing there that I do for Mercedes Benz. 
And when I went into salary negotiations with the group, she called me on the side to say, you know, I appreciate the salary that you put out there. But by the way, we budgeted 50,000 more than you're asking for. So I need you to negotiate your salary. And this is the range I need you to do it in. So, um, so clearly the next day I did just that, but had it not been for her kind of putting that bug in my ear to say, this is what the market will support. So you need to come back and try again. I don't know that I would have been able to kind of realize that salary increase in the first place. So thanks to her, I, I, I get to, I get to at least make more money to do what I think is fun. Yeah, I think we all, I have to think of ourselves as community members and that as the perspective of how much of an impact that we can make by just having those frank discussions about compensation. Um, I know at my previous employer, one of the ways that I was able to be assured that I was making equal to some of my com I, um, folks at the similar level is just because people had like a, an open spreadsheet of this is the pay that I make, this is my gender, this is how long I've been in the role. Um, it was very anonymized, but just being able to go in there and see at the, um, it had been a few years of doing it, so it was at a large scale, but I was able to be like, okay, I'm at this level, someone who's in the same city I am is making the same amount. Okay, now I'm sure that I did all right, but there's a lot of different things that, that can happen there. Do you have anything to add here, Caitlin? Um, yeah, I think uh, compensation discussions are very taboo. Like most yeah. companies don't really want us to talk about it because, or be transparent with each other about it um, because it keeps everybody's salaries lower. Um, but having these open, honest conversations, as difficult as they are, um, is really important. And I've mentored. Uh, more junior engineers um, and had frank conversations about salary with them and they had no idea. They were just, wait, I can, I can ask, I can negotiate when I get a rate, when I get a promotion. I didn't know I could do that. Um, oh, I can talk to people about this, that's okay. Um, so like having these like open and honest conversations as difficult as it is, um, is a way that we can like bring all of, all of each other together um, forward. Um, yeah, I also love levels that FYI and all the other companies that are doing a great job on just getting information out there to folks about what salaries look like. In your history, Alex, have you seen this before? And do you think that it's going to make a difference as we go forward? This has changed so much in, in the last few years because, um, yeah, the men I work with talked all the time about their, you know, they would, they had no no issues talking about salaries. I think it, it was taboo for a while, but I think that's a really important um, point. And this is this is where we get back into mentoring. And Caitlin, you, that what you just described is a, a perfect example of that. And and coaching your staff on how to advocate for themselves. Um, I, I think it's important to know your value. And as other companies compete for you, you know, if if you're not going out there and, and looking at, at new positions every couple of years to see what you're worth, you're doing yourself a disservice. Like you should go out and, and check your value and see what somebody else would pay for you. And then take that back to your HR and negotiate uh, the next time you have well, a and promotion. I would, and I, you know, I would say also that as, as hiring managers, you know, um, we need to be aware of our own biases in this vein. So, <clears throat> Harvard Business Review released a study, uh, I want to say a few weeks ago, about the perception that women and minorities don't ask for the raises and promotions that they think they want. It turns out that that's actually not true. But clearly, hiring managers are perhaps biased, and, and maybe that's part of the, the reason that, that women and minorities generally are, are not seeing the same realization that, um, that maybe, maybe other people are. Yeah, and we can't also, we can't discuss this without saying that some people just can't afford to take the risk as much as other groups, right? Like um, just if people are biased against a diverse candidate bringing up that the fact that they want more money, they you also as a diverse candidate might be worried that they'll take even the offer that they have on the table away from you. Um, I know that when I was first looking for my roles, I was in, in, despite the fact that I'd been mentored and coached to um, go out there and kind of negotiate for my salary, I was just like, 
this is a life changing amount of money for my family. <laughs> Even if without negotiating, I don't want to, if I'm making more than my parents make, how do I kind of have that conversation? Because I don't feel like I have the power in this perspective, right? So the, that some of that can definitely be helped by the hiring managers also advocating for the candidate as well. Um, so to talk about hiring managers and for folks who are on the hiring side, what are the things you think people can do to ensure that there is a inclusive community on their team? So, so recently, and I would say um, really in the past six months, based on what we've gone through the, the past year and a half, a, a new potential of remote candidates has opened up. So again, I mentioned that I have to compete with a lot of big name companies every time I have a position open. Um, now I can look outside of my immediate geographic range and look anywhere in the country for this particular resource. And that does open up you know, it, it's hard because when you get a resume, you don't have a photo and you try not to judge when you're looking at potential candidates, um, what they're, you know, what are, what's the background that, that those are coming from. And you can, you can treat everybody on an equal basis, but I, I love now that I can have a, a, a Zoom um, type of interview with someone anywhere, living anywhere in the country. And I think that that's a, that opens up a lot of potential. Yeah, and I know that there's so many opportunities for folks who are in different markets. I have lived in New York for a while, even though I've moved away now. And I'll note everyone wants to live in New York. <laughs> so being able to stay where you are and keep and have the same opportunities is really open things up with the remote. Yeah, we have the same problem here in Seattle. It's not everybody's cup of tea. <laughs> Yeah. Um, other than um, a, a wider pool of um, candidates, uh, just based on like physical location, is that you also might get candidates who no might not normally want to work in an office um, that you're now it's your companies are exposed to. So um, offices are very much geared towards extroverts um, and uh, introverts might not do well in an office and they might be forced into, in the past have been forced into an office situation and they just aren't as successful um, and you might not retain them. But given having this option of being able to work remote means that you get access to people uh, who can be successful in their own right, in their own way, without you having to dictate, you have to be in the office at this day, at this time. Um, you also get uh, the pool opens up to all different kinds of diverse candidates too. So um, physical ability, neurodiversity, um, everything like physical location, like I said. So um, having the remote option, I feel like is a huge win for any team that's trying to build a diverse group. Yeah, uh, sorry, I think I interrupted someone. I apologize, go ahead. No, I, I was going to say that, I, you know, I think building <clears throat> diverse teams kind of starts with the hiring manager. Like I've been on teams before where there was no recognition for the need for DEI for diverse candidates generally. Um, and, and I think as a hiring manager, I get to at least set the, the expectation and to establish the culture that that's something that we value. Um, and so when we go uh, recruiting for various candidates, that's one of the things that is high on my list of, of things that we need to consider for, uh, for a candidate to, con to, to bring them onto our team. Um, and I would say, um, you know, one of, the, one of the comments, Caitlin, that you made yesterday is that uh, I think we have to be super careful, again, with our biases about people being in the office because office offices were created by extroverts for extroverts and by default that means that we're missing out on a whole pool of candidates that probably doesn't fit uh, under the umbrella of being extroverted so you know again watching our biases as, as hiring managers and kind of the cultures that we set on our teams i think that was a really good point lisa i think as hiring managers we have to sell and share the message of the inclusivity that we believe in, that our teams will have and, and that our companies are, are advocating for. 
we have to really make sure that the candidates understand how important that is to our culture at work. And um, since not everyone here would, would be a hiring manager, what are the things that you think just a team member can do, a regular like individual contributor, um, someone who's kind of like mid-range engineering, still working their way up to be more inclusive or build an inclusive culture as well? I mean, from my perspective, it's one of the things that I actively mentor um, on my team members. Um, you know, I see our one-on-one our -on -one time as their personal consultation time with me to try to figure out how do they develop the skill sets and kind of the thinking habits and learning habits for, you know, progressing in their careers. And that's one of the things that we focus on is how do we, how do we treat our, our colleagues? Um, how do we consider them? What are the biases that we come out of the gate with that, that maybe need a, a rethink? Um, so I, I think, as, as, at least from my perspective, that's one of the things that I can do to kind of help my team members uh, hopefully realize their own biases and, and maybe um, turn that around and, and kind of benefit not only themselves, but potential people that they may lead one day. I love that. I know that I definitely, um, some of the things that have helped me feel more included is just, I kind of think inclusion has to be explicit as uh, that's how I describe it. Like you can't just be like, oh yeah, we're inclusive. We've invited everyone just sort of actively going out to the new folks and being like, hi, you're welcome. It seems very different to me. So all the different ways of um, ensuring that everyone feels that they can, uh, they do have space on the team. Um, I love the fact that a lot of companies do give onboarding folks a buddy so that they can hopefully be their first person that they can go to on a team to feel like connected to, even especially with virtual that you're like, at least I know one person that if I'm unsure what to do next, they're my go-to person mm -hmm. other than my manager, right? Um, all of these are ways that I think folks can make sure that the environment can feel inclusive to newer folks. And, and I'd like to say to the people who are listening, if you if you feel like you need mentorship, don't wait for someone to assign. Go ask. Find someone you think you can talk to at, at work, whether they be a peer or, or a manager of another team. Or, or and, and ask for mentorship. Ask for sponsorship. Um, you would be surprised how willing people are to help you with your career and to help you at your job. Well, and I would say that, you know, um, I've learned over at least my career anyway, I tend to be an, a fairly introverted person often. Uh, even introverts, though, need to learn ass assertiveness, right? And, and really, that's the only way that you're, you're going to be your own best advocate for progressing in your career. Um, so actually, we have a question. So if everyone else has questions, please put them in the questions tab. So this question is, um, any advice that you'd give to younger women, like high school or earlier, to push them to study in a field within engineering? Uh, Caitlin, do you mind if we start with you? Sure. Um, if, if you like a challenge, engineering, and you like problem solving, engineering is a great place to go. Um, there's a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of growth opportunities in it. Um, you get to meet a lot of interesting people. Um, uh, and it's such a, so wide ranging nowadays that you can really go anywhere, work for any kind of company. You're not just like limited to these like major tech companies, like every single company is a tech company now. Um, so, uh, there is so much potential and it's a lot of fun. Um, and uh, you you really get to challenge yourself a lot um, and there's a lot of growth opportunities. So I would say it starts even before high school. So if you have an influential position in your life to, to make a difference with a young female, um, a child, you know, the toys, get them Legos, get them uh, started with computer games, get them, show them that, that, that these things are not just for, for boys. Um, but I, I think really it needs to start before high school. I think, I think you know, the, the robot, robotics club, the, those type of things. Um, I, I love, 
even going to high schools and volunteering um, with the young women in STEM and trying to get them to see the potential of what they can do. Have that opportunity, but yeah, it starts from the very beginning. Think about it when they're little. Yeah, you know, I would I would say one of the things that I tell um, younger women is to be patient, and I know that's a hard thing to have to have to do. I know a lot of women who've left tech intentionally over the years because they ran into so many barriers, um, and and some of those still exist in some ways. But I would say, you know, just be patient. Try to try to work through those issues that you encounter. There is a reward on the other side for that, and and it's in you know challenging problems that you get to solve. Um, you know, hopefully a more diverse work group that you get to work with. There are a lot of benefits to being in tech and especially in the DevOps space. And so, you know, if, if, if they can be receptive to it, that's kind of one of the things that I like to tell them is to just be patient, just work through it. It will all work out uh, to your benefit at some point. I love all of this. I think it's all great. Uh, we have a couple more questions actually keep them coming um so in regards to remote work do you feel that there's a bias against people working remotely and how can hiring managers ensure remote workers are not left out or passed over because they're not in person i think this is definitely very timely with us still adjusting to working remotely because of COVID, as we adjust to just being more remote friendly hopefully going forward So um, pretty much all of all of our staff right now is remote. Um, I think only a few a handful of us are still going back into the office. Um, I think it's really important to have regular one on one meetings with your remote staff. Um, I think it's important to have group meetings as, as much as you can. I think it's important to reach out to anybody who is remote and just make sure they understand that you're there for them. Um, it's hard because we're all we're all trying to figure this this new reality out of how we're working in this environment. Um, but I, I think communication is key to making that successful. You know, don't just don't just assume that person's out there working. Check check in on them. Don't micromanage them, but check in on them and just see um, how they're doing on a day to day basis. Maybe a couple times a week. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, for my teams, it actually, actually, one of the really frustrating things for me is that I, I'm hearing a lot from companies here in the area where I am that uh, companies are choosing to go with a hybrid model, which means basically that they want you in the office two or three days a week, and then the other days you can work from home. Um, and and uh, in almost every case, that's being pushed from the executive level. And one of the things that I often hear quoted as a reason for that and uh, is, is because they think innovation is not happening through remote work. I disagree with that. I think my teams and I have proven that we're more than capable to be innovative and to deliver product on time, uh, even working entirely remotely with each other. Our communication hasn't suffered, our work hasn't suffered, our delivery hasn't suffered. And so I, I think companies need to be clear about their own biases and maybe what's driving that uh, uh, not that lack of trust, I guess, in remote workers generally. Um, there's a company here in the area who published a study that people keep referencing that I really wish they wouldn't have, have published. But, you know, again, I think that that means that we need to kind of check our biases to really understand why are, why are people wanting to work remotely and what is the upside to that as opposed to a perception of there being a downside. There are so many advantages to remote work, including that work-life balance that's so important that I was talking about before. Um, and for the, for, I think we are really breaking barriers and showing people that we can be collaborative, we can be creative, we can get the job done remote. And Lisa, what you said is so important, trust. Trust your employees, they're gonna do their work. They know how important it is, you know, show them that you trust them. That's a really important piece. Um, so a related question here is like, what what, do you, what are things that we can do to make folks who are part of a remote team know that they feel part of the team and that the team cares about them? Uh, I think I'll have Caitlin start with that one. 
Yeah, um, half of my team right now is full time remote. Um, so uh, something that I think a lot about now and um, some of the things that we do is we have dedicated times throughout the week that are non work related over Zoom game days where we play some sort of game together and we just kind of hang out because um, you can't all be in the same room. You can't just go and have lunch together. Um, so like having that kind of connection still that you would have got normally gotten in the office um, has, I think it's been, it's been really great. It like gets people to kind of know each other, especially if you've onboarded while you're remote, you might not get to know people socially. Um, uh, so we've been we've been doing that, and um, I think like having team members who might not have uh, direct direct reporting structures have their own one on ones where they can kind of just like hang out, have a regular touch point, so they can feel connected, whether you're in the office or they're in the office or whatever it is. Uh, so one thing I ask my teams to do remotely is is please turn on your camera at least for the first five minutes so we can see each other face to face, which is really hard for some of the introverted folks. But I think just making that physical connection, that visual connection is important. I mean, after five minutes, I'd like you can turn your camera off if you don't want to stay on, that's totally fine. But, but just pay each other the respect to see one another for even a short period. Yeah, I would say, you know, for my teams, um, we, Ten, I, I would I would dare say that our communication cadence with each other and especially with uh, colleagues abroad has actually increased uh, being remote because there's there's more uh, room for that if you're kind of in your own house to kind of have conversations with other people than there would have been in an open office setting. Um, so I think from that perspective, we've really benefited from remote work and kind of connecting not just with the folks here in Seattle, but the folks that we work with worldwide. Um, and, and, you know, one of the other things, too, is that here in the Seattle Hub, anyway, we're lucky that we have uh, people in the Hub who are extroverted, who, who like these activities, these team-based activities to kind of build uh, those relationships uh, with your colleagues. And, you know, in the next few days here, we're actually having a pretzel making night to celebrate Oktoberfest. Has nothing to do with work at all. But, uh, you know, those are the kind of activities we do, cooking classes, you know, gingerbread making classes, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I think there are a lot of things that you can do to kind of make up for not being in an office setting to really be inclusive and to kind of have a little bit of fun with your remote workforce. For sure. OK, so we have three minutes left, so I'm going to do a kind of a I'll ask one of you and if you have a, um, something to add, I'll maybe you can jump in and do a quicker one. But so one question here is, um, what are some ways to move into a role in DevOps from IT? So I'll, I'll direct this to Caitlin, because you've done that. Um, so they said the traditional infrastructure or even other areas of IT that aren't development. Yeah, um, let's see, how did I do that? Um, I realized I got to a point in my career where I um, I wasn't being challenged um, and I wanted a new challenge and software is kind of, there's just so much you can do. Um, so being in IT, while you can build things, um, I wanted to like learn how to build software from scratch. Um, so I, I started learning it on my free time. I learned some of it just at work by building scripts and stuff like that. Um, and then I just tried to automate everything. Um, so if you're, if maybe you have been working in traditional IT where you're used to just set it up once and move on. Um, I just pushed myself to automate everything I could come across. Um, and that kind of mindset kind of moved me more into the DevOps space. Great. Uh, the question I have for you, Lisa, is um, do you have any advice or exercises for getting people to stand and be heard? advocate on their own behalf and recognize moments when that they do and recognize moments that they should do those things? Um, I, I do that frequently with with the teams that I lead <clears throat> in helping during our one on ones for them to understand, you know, certain opportunities that, you know, perhaps they could have been more assertive uh, and then finding opportunities for them going forward to kind of exercise that muscle. Assertiveness, especially for introverts, is not a natural context. 
Uh, and so it, it takes time. It takes, you know, kind of working at it and kind of people being willing to understand that that's a skill set that they need. Got it. And I love that answer. The, the last question I'll ask Alex and then I'll um, post to y'all if there's any final thoughts you want to share is um, this question says, the men to women ratio statistically can be disproportionate, as we know. Uh, and then a lot of casual chats and teams are unintentionally driven mostly by men. How can we get those conversations to have more female engagement? Again, this gets back to the sponsorship and, and mentoring. So if you witness something like this, if you're part of a team and you see it being dominated by, by any particular uh, area, um, go outside and communicate with, with your leadership, communicate with your manager, communicate with your peers. Um, you can drive change. It's just part, it's part of a conversation. Again, if, if you are an introvert, you have to assert yourself a little bit like Lisa was saying, but, but you can do this. So thanks all of you. Do you have any final thoughts that you um, want to share with folks about your experiences and what do you think that folks can take away from this if one actionable item that they can do to be more inclusive in their teams? I would give you a heavy one at the end. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Probably the most important bit of advice from me is to be aware of your own biases and how they affect your decision making and your leadership. Choose to do that. Choose to be aware. I would say that's an excellent open point. Circle. Oh, sorry. Um, I would say no, open I was circle. Just say You're standing in a circle. Oh no. <laughs> Caitlin, go for it. Go for it. Okay. Um, open the circle. Uh, let people, uh, if new people come in, open the circle and let them feel included. Uh, don't keep the circle closed. And the Alex? I, I don't know if I can talk both of those um, great suggestions. I think that this was a great panel and just want to say thank you to Datadog for allowing us to, to have this, this conversation, which is often a very difficult conversation. Um, I think with all of us being aware, um, that is the most important thing we can do. Just keep it yes. foremost in your mind. Thank you for that. And thanks all of you for participating in this panel. We can continue the conversation on social media if we would like on, on the chat. Also, we have a iteration of this panel that's focused on EMEA participants and also our, it's going to be held with folks who live and work in EMEA. So if you want to participate in that, it's going to be tomorrow. And thank you to all of you and see you and enjoy the rest of your dash. Cheers. Cheers.